Okay, uh, welcome students to a, what is this, lecture seven, a theoretical lecture seven, where we are going to cover a new type of electromagnetic mode, an optical mode, uh, but in general, electromagnetic mode. In particular, it's going to be a resonant mode and uh, called surface plasmons. So, most of the time, uh, people that know about surface plasmons just in passing do not think of surface plasmons as something associated with pattern materials, that it is really just associated with a single surface, perhaps just even a flat surface. So boring single flat surface between a metal and a dielectric, so between a metal and a dielectric interface, uh, or a metal dielectric interface, uh, at that interface, what the metal can do, it can support an electronic charge distribution uh, at that interface, namely at particular regions uh, on the interface, and I have a uh, figure later on, uh, what is it, uh, yeah, at, uh, on uh, page two of these notes and uh, later, but at the surface you can have uh, areas of excess charge, uh, excess electrons, for example, and then right next to it, a region where uh, those excess electrons have come from, therefore creating a deficiency, a deficit in electrons, leading to a net positive charge. So at this surface, you can have negative charge, positive charge, negative charge, positive charge, all following after another. And so there, and when you have those separations at this surface of negative charge, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, at this interface, um, they will tend to not to remain there because there is a Coulombic potential to have the positive, ch the negative charge uh, and positive charges go towards each other and basically cancel themselves out. But then they tend to overshoot and then the positive and negative switch positions and it's, uh, all over the surface, that creates a charge oscillation at the surface. That's what a surface plasmon is. It is a charge distribution, a charge oscillation. But wherever you have electronic charges, you also have electromagnetic fields, both in the metal and as well in the dielectric glass material, the insulator above the metal. And so surface plasmons are the charge oscillations, the charge distributions, along with the associated uh, electromagnetic fields. So, surface plasmons are composed of the charge oscillations and the associated electromagnetic fields. Um, now, so, however, this is where we get into the issue of why surface plasmons are showing up in this course on pattern materials. Because we'll see that uh, surface plasmons are somewhat boring. Um, for just a single flat interface where you have infinitely long, ex semi-infinite, uh, long extensive dielectric, meaning it stops here, but it goes up to infinity. Uh, and on the other side, the bottom half of space is composed of the metal. That surface can very well, it certainly can support surface plasmons, but those surface plasmons um, are fairly limited in how we can, we as humans, or anything, can uh, generate them, detect them, use them, or have them affect uh, the outside world. Because they are confined to the metal dielectric interface, um, which means that they evanescently decrease in strength, the field profiles, away from the interface. But they are very strong at the interface, very strong. Um, now, what we will talk about is the fact that if you do introduce a pattern to the metal surfaces, all of a sudden, uh, the surface plasmons, which were originally not radiating, and I'll show, show you why that's the case. They cannot, on flat surfaces, surface plasmons, <sighs> excuse me, surface plasmons cannot uh, be excited by incident light nor can they couple with radiating light, giving up their energy to an, an emitted light beam. 
for example, and a mint light. So on flat surfaces, that coupling between the surface plasmons and any sort of radiating mode, either incident or emissive, is impossible. But if you pattern uh, the metal surface, you can't. You can have very strong interactions with incident light and radiating light, such that you can excite the surface plasmons with incident light. And the surface plasmons can decay into an emitted light. All right? That's only possible via the pattern. And depending on how you do the patterning, you will get different properties for this now complex, this now patterned metal dielectric interface. <coughs> so extraordinarily interesting, but only when you start patterning in the structure. All right. So, but as a start, what we have to do is we have to step back a bit before we get into the very interesting structures of pattern metal surfaces and surface plasmons that are on those surfaces or supported by those surfaces. We have to step back and just take a look at the flat interface. So that's what we start on page two. Let me check to see if my video is functioning correctly. It would appear so. All right. So we can switch back. Continue what we're doing. All right. So let's work through Maxwell's equations. Uh, and assume we have a charge distribution at the interface between a dielectric and a metal. All right. So again, we have an e to the minus i omega time dependence. We have uh, all the Maxwell's equations. We're really just going to be using these two. Um, and assuming a non-magnetic metal, so mu is equal to mu naught. Uh, epsilon, of course, is not epsilon naught. You have a metal and you have a dielectric. Both of those are different than vacuum. <coughs> so, um, so we start with Maxwell's equations. All right. Now the next step, when expressing the EM fields of surface plasmons, we take into account that that um, uh, they decrease exponentially away from the interface. <clears throat> meaning their fields, all their fields, the E's, the H's, the B's, they all uh, decay exponentially away from the interface. Therefore, for Y is greater than zero, <clears throat> uh, where is that? Right here, for Y is greater than zero, we have to have an exponential um, dependence for the fields of E to the minus alpha 1 by, where we don't know alpha yet. That will come from Maxwell's equations, the boundary conditions. <coughs> so we express uh, E X, E Y, and H Z. All right, and that's the only polarization we have to look at. This is called T N polarization, transverse magnetic, because we have Z being transverse or parallel to the interface. So transverse magnetic, only an H of Z, not an H of x or an h of y. Why do we need that? It's because of this reason right here. There needs to be an EY component of the field for a surface charge to exist. Pure and simple. All right. If you need to review why that's the case, go back to uh, your intro in m course book where they cover boundary conditions. All right. And it comes about from this boundary condition right here, about how uh, an EY, yeah, an EY component, a non-zero EY component, is absolutely necessary for you to have a surface charge. It comes about from the boundary conditions resulting from this equation right here. So that'll be in your introductory EM book, Sudoku or e e Lobby or uh, Griffiths or any one of those EM books. Look at that chapter. So, but that means we only have to look at the TM polarization. Transverse magnetic, where HC is the only H component that's not zero. So all of them will have the same uh, Y dependence, meaning they're exponentially decreasing with Y. <coughs> and they're propagating in the X direction. So along the surface, they propagate along the uh, X the interface, all right, but only in the x direction. Now, from the wave equation, you would get this dispersion relation. <coughs> the, 
that k squared is equal to epsilon 1 omega squared over c squared is equal to, generally this would be kx squared plus ky squared. If this were ik, but it's not ik, iky. It's not iky, it's minus alpha 1. Because you don't have an i there, and because you have the minus, uh, this, the, it turns into this relation right here. All right, And you can work that through with the wave equation. All right, again, back to elementary EM book textbooks. All right? Um, and so uh, you now know the relation, because you will uh, basically know omega, the frequency, and, uh, or you'll know kx, and then from that you'll find the frequency. And then from those, you will be able to eliminate one of your undetermined factors, your alpha 1, from using this relation, all right? So we've already gotten rid of one sort of unknown or parameter, this alpha 1. This is the decay coefficient. Uh, it's that, or, uh, yeah, or the decay constant, and so on. All right, <clears throat> now though, uh, we will be working uh, to try to figure out ways to determine two of these uh, unknown coefficients in terms of the third. So one of them we can just set to be equal to unity, all right? And that's what we'll do with C1. We'll just set it to unity later, you'll see that. But then solve what B1 and A1 are. And the one stands for the fact that we're in material one, the dielectric, all right, above the y, uh, x, y plane. So using this Maxwell's equations, we can get relationships between EX and HZ and EY and HZ. You take HZ, take the y derivative for this, the x derivative for this one, and uh, then set uh, what we get over here with E of x, what was up here. And that gives us a relationship relation for a of y in terms of c, I mean a1 in terms of c1. And similarly, this right here gives us a relation between c1 and b1. Uh, doing those calculations, we see that a1 is equal to this, and b1 is equal to this. All right. Same thing for region 2. <coughs> You get the very same thing, uh, same relation for your alpha. But note that this is going to be different than alpha 1 because you have an epsilon 2 or epsilon of the metal, which is very, very different than the epsilon for the dielectric. Okay? But, and also notice that the sign here is positive. That, that is obvious. The reason for that is obvious, and that's because the fields have to decay as you go to increasingly larger negative values of y. So, obviously, this has to be a positive. Uh, but this stays the same, and you'll note here that I use the same kx as I do here. All right? That's sort of an assumption, but one that we should all be comfortable making now. For a variety of reasons, well, at least for a couple of reasons. The easiest reason uh, to use and to see is the fact that, is using the fact that boundary conditions have to be satisfied uh, at all locations at the interface, all x values and all z values, all right, and all the values along that plane. And so, therefore, if we can get the boundary conditions to happen at one location, then the fields have to have the same x dependence at that um, y position so that the boundary conditions are met everywhere else. So you have to have the same x dependence for the fields and the same z dependence for the fields. And so that's, that's why we have to have this term being exactly equal to To this term. So that term and that term have to be the same. So you wouldn't have k1x uh, and k2x 
uh, where k 1x and 2x are different because then you wouldn't have the same x minutes of the fields and the boundary conditions might be satisfied in one location at the interface but as you go into a different x position it may not be. Uh, if you have k1x and k2x being different, you can't have that. So k1x and k2x have to be the same. So that that's, uh, simplifies our work just a bit. Um, you can also get that simply from Maxwell's equations and boundary conditions. Um, but if you've done that enough, you feel comfortable with just skipping that step, um, as I do. All right? But just like we did with a1 and b1, we can do that with a2 and uh, B2, uh, B2, this needs to be B2 right here, is equal to this. So then we can express the fields uh, in terms of just C1, which we can set to unity when we look at these boundary conditions. So now we just do the boundary conditions. Continuity of HZ for 1, boundary condition 1, and continuity of EX, boundary condition number 2. Boundary condition number 1, Continuity of uh, HZ at y is equal to 0 gives you that C1 is equal to C2, and we set that to be equal to unity. And uh, boundary condition number 2, uh, continuity of EX, well, we write down what EX is at y is equal to 0. Um, and we get that A1 is equal to A2. We write the A1 and A2 in terms of C1 and C2 cancel various, various things out, and this is what we get. Right. Okay. Expressed in terms of the alphas, the epsilons. But we know what alpha is, the two alphas. Here's alpha 2, and here's alpha 1. So we substitute that in. This is alpha 1, this is alpha 2. Uh, we simplify. A bit, and we get uh, a relationship now between kx and omega with all these other factors. Uh, of course, it would be omega over c in free space in a vacuum. Um, and it would be k, uh, omega over c square root of epsilon 1 uh, if it were if the wave was just propagating freely in dielectric epsilon 1. But instead of that, we have, uh, we have these other terms, this epsilon 2 in the square root and the epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2. All right. So this is a different dispersion curve. And so this, this defined a dispersion curve that gives you omega on the y-axis, kx on the x-axis. All right. Um, but before we graph that out, um, let's, yeah, we're going to graph that out later uh, in this curve here. This is that dispersion curve the, uh, that, that we just saw for. This right here is given on page, is shown here on page 9. All right. That will define basically this. But let me take you through what epsilon 2 is first before we, we do this. All right. So this is uh, the SP dispersion curve. And th these are the energies and momentum that light can have. All right. Now, um, you may notice something interesting about that, but let's get to that in a little bit. All right. Before we do that, this, so this is the SP dispersion curve. Um, Okay, uh, epsilon 1 is our dielectric. That might be 2.1 for a glass material. It might just be 1 for air. Epsilon 2 is our metal. All right, so interesting thing to do for a metal is just use a typical type of model uh, that's commonly used in all the solid-state physics books, whether that be Cattell, Ashcroft, and Merman, you name it. Uh, to uh, the common uh, model to calculate epsilon metal, and that's given by this, called the Druda model. It epsilon infinity, that means the epsilon, uh, when the frequency goes to infinity, 
So as you let this go to infinity, epsilon approaches this. And this is called the bulk plasma frequency, or just the plasma frequency, but it's really the bulk plasma frequency. And that's characterized and measured for each different metal. For silver, it is uh, 1.32 times 10 to the 16th radians per second, and the epsilon infinity is 1. Um, if you were to plot this out, you see that below the plasma frequency, divided by um, square root of epsilon infinity, so below a particular frequency, the uh, dielectric constant relative permittivity uh, becomes negative. So that if for silver, that is all throughout the visible and uh, well into the IR. Uh, you will have a negative value for epsilon. And these negative values actually can be quite high. In the visible spectral regime in the IR, they can be minus 10, minus 50, even for some very good metals, minus 100. Um, but very large, but negative. And then when you get above the plasma frequency, um, then the epsilon turns positive. But the, this is where you will, uh, for these frequencies, and only frequencies at which epsilon metals less than zero, in fact, less than one, uh, will you have surface plasmas. Um, so then with this, with this for the value of epsilon metal, you can plug this in uh, for your epsilons. Um, all right, and so, so we have the dispersion curve. So now we can write the dispersion curve. Uh, we can substitute in for kx our dispersion curve. For k naught, remember, uh, I've used that as shorthand notation for, the, for many different lectures. Uh, k naught is equal to omega over c. All right. So we have the k, omega over c squared, or k naught squared, this epsilon 1, epsilon metal, epsilon 1 plus epsilon metal. Um, and then you have this term right here that stays. Okay, you do some simplification and you get this, that epsilon 1 squared is uh, equal to this, all right? Now, uh, this needs to be, this whole thing over here, a positive quantity, because epsilon 1 is positive. It's going to be real itself. So, what that says is that this has to, this is positive and this is positive. That must say this is negative for surface plasmons to exist, for these fields to be exponentially decaying away from the interface. This denominator has to be negative. So that means epsilon m has to be more negative than epsilon 1 is positive. So that for real good metals, for real metals, um, silver, copper, gold, aluminum, um, but even uh, some heavily doped oxides and some other things you wouldn't traditionally think of as metals, but at particular frequencies they behave as metals. Um, and when I say that, it's where epsilon m, the dielectric constant of that material, is, is a high negative value. Uh, often, uh, epsilon m is much greater in magnitude, meaning it is much more negative than epsilon 1 is positive. Uh, then you can take the square, you can drop that sign, take the square root, and you get, uh, you get your decay constant as that. All right. Similarly, alpha 2, the decay constant is given by this, where instead of the uh, epsilon 1, you have epsilon m, which again, this is very large. All right. Epsilon m in itself is a very high negative number, so when you take the absolute magnitude, it's a very high positive number. What this means, comparing this to this, shows that epsilon 1 is much smaller than epsilon, I mean, alpha 1 is much smaller than alpha 2. And that's because epsilon 1 is much less than epsilon m. So that means that the fields decay uh, much more rapidly in the metal than the dielectric. But they still decay quite rapidly even in the dielectric. Basically this says that, okay, so uh, the, the fields are confined to the interface, 
uh, but you have fields that extend in the dielectric, and you only have a very small amount of fields that, that exist within the metal, but it's right at the interface. All right? That's the surface plasma. Um, so, also, as the frequency increases from low, from low frequencies, where epsilon m is much, much less than epsilon 1, so, uh, see, remember this. The epsilon, for as you go lower and lower frequency, it becomes more and more negative. So for low frequencies, epsilon m is, is much, much larger, the absolute magnitude, than epsilon 1. But um, as your frequency increases, this starts not to be the case anymore. Um, and epsilon, at particular frequencies, epsilon m is no longer much larger than epsilon 1 magnitudes. Magnitude. Uh, there comes a point where epsilon m is approximately equal to epsilon 1. When this occurs, your kx goes to infinity. And you get that from the dispersion curve we saw for earlier. As these two uh, values become equal but opposite, so this is uh, a negative value and this is the same value but positive, you'll get close to zero here, and kx goes to infinity. All right? That means that you won't have any x dependence in the field. I'm sorry. You'll have, a, uh, you'll have an extraordinarily strong x dependence. But what you won't have, uh, you won't have any decay uh, in the y direction. <clears throat> and basically... Um, yeah, and, and so your surface plasma just becomes a very high momentum uh, mode. Momentum is associated with Kx. For low frequencies, where epsilon n is much, much larger than 1, uh, you get that K, the surface plasma momentum is approximately equal to this. That's because epsilon m is much greater than epsilon 1, so you can neglect that. But once you do that, you can cancel the epsilon m's, and then you just have this. Uh, omega over c times square root of epsilon 1. It's your kx. Now, but this is interesting. Because uh, this would be the kx value for propagating light in a material that has a dielectric constant of epsilon 1. So, regular propagating light uh, in a material that has epsilon 1, uh, you would have this momentum value, all right, for the propagating mode. So this is saying it's all in the x direction. So along the interface, um, for very low frequencies, you'll have a propagating mode that's not confined to the interface. Um, uh, that has this kx, but also the surface plasma that is confined in the interface, essentially has the same kx. All right, so two very different modes: one that is confined to the interface, surface plasma at low frequencies, and propagating modes, ones that aren't confined to the interface, uh, but still grazing the interface. They both have the same kx dependence on omega. All right. And we'll see that in our dispersion curve. For low frequency frequencies, the surface plasma mode hugs or, or is almost the same as the freely propagating light mode, its momentum. Um, but uh, note that the KXP is always greater than this. All right? So if we skip ahead to the light cone, we'll see that that at low frequencies here, at low frequencies, like right around here, the surface plasma mode hugs the mode for the grazing propagating light. All right, this right here, the grazing propagating light mode. Um, but the KX is always just a little bit larger, just a little bit larger than the propagating mode. All right, so that's what this is saying right here. Okay, so you, they're never equal for a flat interface. Uh, this is always just a bit larger, all right? And as the frequency goes up, as the frequency goes up, 
this difference becomes larger and larger and larger, where finally this basically goes to infinity uh, at the location for, for this condition. And then the, any light modes and surface plasma modes are very different in terms of their energy and momentum. All right, so for the same energy, uh, this grazing mode that would be grazing the interface would have this pre uh, this momentum, whereas for the surface plasmon, it would have this momentum. Very different momentums, therefore they cannot couple. They cannot, coupling requires conservation of energy and momentum, omega and kx. And you can't have that, they can't couple. So going back up to here, hence propagating light, either incident upon the interface or emitted from the interface, cannot couple with SP modes. All right. So and this is where I, I go, saying for instant light, uh, you have this dispersion relation here. The maximum value kx can be is when it's grazing, meaning that uh, all the light is coming straight in the x direction. Therefore, ky is zero. And then kx max is this, which I've already mentioned when I'm talking about this equation. All right. So this is uh, that defines our light cone. This defines our light cone. Uh, it, when you make a graph of omega versus k uh, and map out and draw the uh, all, all the different energies, omegas and kx's that propagating light cones can have based on this equation right here, uh, you will get all everything in this cone propagating light can have in terms of energy and momentums. All right? Where this is only kx. All right? So this is a kx max. This is a kx max right here. All right? It can have a kx min, which is zero, when the light is either coming straight down or going straight up. That, that means that k kx is zero, it's not going in the x direction, only in the y, and then that would be a mode right on this axis right here. All right, But uh, this defines the light cone. And what you see when you uh, plot out all of the light cone and this, the surface plasma dispersion curves is that they never overlap for flat surfaces. So you can never have uh, conservation of energy and momentum uh, between uh, SP, radiating light, propagating light, coupling. So they can't couple, all right? The SP dispersion curve always lies outside the light cone, all right? And so finally, I guess um, this is where I decided to put down a picture of what I described in words. Metal, dielectric, um, and this is a surface plasma. Uh, excess electrons. A deficiency of electrons and those two things oscillate this is a snapshot in time this right here but if you were to take that snapshot uh, uh, another one uh, a little bit later you would see that uh, that these excess electrons have gone towards positive and you'll have the charges oscillate and that's a surface plasma they oscillate at a particular frequency and uh, this this period of oscillation the period of the charge distribution um, is characterized by the kx. All right. So then uh, we get one other thing out of the way before we start uh, patterning, before we start looking at ways to get light out of surface plasmons or excite surface plasmons with incident light. And that's something just fairly simple and fairly easy. We have to look at power flow. Um, within a surface plasma, a fairly interesting thing. So we're going to uh, take the fields that we've already solved for, both in region one and region two, and solve for the pointing vector, uh, E1 cross H1 star. We do that, uh, we get that, uh, this right here, for, and this is in the x direction, the x hat, in the y direction, y hat, and uh, we see that this is imaginary, so no, you have no real power flow in the y direction. So this, if alpha 1 is itself positive, which it is, and epsilon 1 is positive, which it is. 
So this is, uh, um, well, no, even if they are. Uh, so you have the eye here that takes care of it. So that's that. So, so you have no real power flow in the y direction, but you do in the x direction, which we expect. You can have power going in the x direction. And it's given by this. All right. Um, so, so it's given by this. This is all easy. Um, very interesting. And when you do that for S2, you get this. So the only change is that the alphas are different and the epsilons are different. Uh, then to get the total energy, this is the pointing vector. So energy density, en energy density flow, or energy flow density. So you will uh, integrate that uh, from 0 to infinity for region 1. 0 to minus infinity for region 2, and you get these two values here. The total power flow um, is given by the sum. You add those up, and this is what you get. So, total power flow. Uh, we, we take a look at this. Uh, these are all positive. And, boy, we can restrict kx to be for the positive. Now, Alpha 1 is positive, Epsilon 1 is positive, Alpha 2 is positive, but Epsilon 2 is negative, alright? Epsilon 2 is negative. It's a metal, alright? And so that's interesting because uh, basically these power flows are going to be going in different directions. For material, for region 1, you'll have power flow in one direction, but in region 2, you'll have power flow in the opposite direction. Really sort of interesting. Really interesting. Um, the ratio of the power is given by this, so you can take a look to see uh, which region is, is uh, transporting more power, and it turns out where metal is transporting more, uh, is tra transporting less power. So it's P2, P1 over P2. So when epsilon, when the metal is acting more metallic-like, um, there is more power in the dielectric than the metal. All right. Um, but as Kx goes to infinity, we see that epsilon 1 approaches minus epsilon m. And in that case, uh, the two powers are equal but opposite such that as much power as you have going in the x direction is equal to as much power as going in the minus x direction, therefore canceling themselves out. So that's extraordinarily interesting. Um, and useful. Essentially that's saying, well, then you don't have any energy flow. All right? And so that essentially uh, you are parking the energy at particular locations. All right? And so that's extremely useful if you can park energy at particular locations. Because already the surface plasmon has parked its energy right at the interface. But now we're saying we have no energy flow in the other directions as well. So in that case, uh, the energy is confined in all three dimensions. Uh, in the y direction, due to the fact it's a surface plasmon. And then the x, x and z. Uh, because of the fact we're at a particular frequency where the power flows are equal but opposite. All right. Okay, that's interesting. But we still have not ask, uh, address the question of how to get light into, how to get energy into or out of the SP modes. In fact, what we've said is that for flat interfaces, you cannot. You cannot get energy into and out of it um, via propagating modes, be it an incident beam or having the surface plasmons coupled to radiate the modes. So now we have to look at various methods to do that. Um, the first method we will look at is uh, the Kretschmar configuration. So if we have a configuration that involves a thin film with a high dielectric material on one side, we can then have two light cones one defined by epsilon 1 and one defined by epsilon 3. With the, so dielectric, metal, dielectric. So we have the two different uh, light cones. The one defined by epsilon 1, that's this inside one. So epsilon uh, 1, 
And then we have the one defined by epsilon 3. Epsilon 3 is going to be greater than epsilon 1 because the slope is less than, than the slope for like cone 1. All right? Okay. But now we remember that uh, the re remember from this light cone right up here that the SPs hug the light cone associated with that side's light cone, that side's dielectric, and so the surface plasmons for for interface one to two will hug light cone one. So this is the surface plasmon dispersion curve for the surface plasmons that reside at this interface between material 1 and material 2. And that's what I'm plotting right here. All right. But then we notice something very interesting. That the we can have propagating light modes down here that can couple to the surface plasmons here at this interface. And that's because we have a certain region of frequencies and momentums for which that surface plasma dispersion curve is within the light cone for material 3. That's this right here. So there you go. Uh, so SPs in the re this region can be excited by a beam incident upon the metal film from the material 3 side. So we can have light coming in here. And as long as this is not too thick, we can have uh, the field be able to make their way. Of course, they're evanescently decreased by a good amount because they're having to evanescently propagate through metal. But they nonetheless, if this is thin enough, they can make it to this side, excite surface plasmons on this side. And uh, you can use that with epsilon 3 being a higher dielectric than epsilon 1. You can have... Uh, the incident light come in and excite the surface plasmons on that side. All right, this is the Kretschmar configuration. Then. Typically, they put a prism here of high dielectric. This is either air or sometimes uh, fluid of some sort, water, but it has to be a lower dielectric than this. And then they can send light in at a high angle and be able to generate the surface plasmons on that side of this metal film right here. So that's called the Kretschmar configuration. All right. And uh, the setup is extensively used to detect and characterize or study chemicals and biological species. All right. So uh, what they do in this case is that uh, they will do what's called functionalize the metal surface here with a particular molecule that when there is some sort of species uh, in the air that will want to bind with that, that functionalized molecule, a binding event will occur. All right? And then this molecule will then stick to that interface. All right? And that you can have what's called specificity, meaning that uh, you design these chemicals to only bind to particular chemicals. All right? Say, for example, um, mustard gas, something, for example. Then you can design these chemicals that, that will bind to the gold surface, generally it's gold, um, and await any mustard gas. And it could be, say, oxygen or nitrogen come through and you won't have any binding of it. But then when mustard gas comes in, it will bind to the structure and it will hold it close and sometimes it will cause um, the molecule to collapse in towards the gold surface. Well, um, when that occurs, uh, the surface plasma mode, uh, the epsilon uh, of material one will change. All right, epsilon for material one will change, and then that will change the light cone. Uh, that, that will change this dispersion curve uh, if you change epsilon 1. All right? If you change epsilon 1, this dispersion curve will change. And therefore, uh, you will be able to read that out as a change in, in the frequency of that surface plasma. All right? 
This is called the Kretschmar configuration. Uh, it's used to detect biological and chemical species. And you'll have a homework problem on this. Method two, patterned metal surfaces. <clears throat> as, in, as an alternative to the K configuration, we can use what we have learned about patterned materials. So, and instead of a flat metal interface, we use a periodically undulating a periodically undulating film, or curved film, then the dispersion uh, curve will be what's called band-folded into the first Brillouin zone. Okay, so I said that you would be using material from a prior lecture. This is uh, coming from lecture um, uh, three, maybe, scattering from periodic material, um, where we talked about Brillouin zones. And you'll have band folding, and I'll show you what that means. Uh, we will then have the SP modes in the light. Uh, once you do this band folding, you will then have SP modes in the light cone. Then, if there's SP modes in the light cone, those SP modes can interact, be uh, excited by, and decay into propagating modes. Um, this periodic pattern can be of many types, including a simple curved surface or a whole array. So a simple curved surface where you have dielectric metal. So no longer a flat interface, but it's a periodically curved interface. When you have this, uh, you do this band folding. And what this band folding says is that you have um, the original band diagram. You take the original band diagram. And then you draw uh, here. Then you identify uh, the periodicity is P, okay? P for the lattice constant, um, all right? And then the first Brillouin zone, uh, the kx values uh, at which the zone ends is pi over p, pi over p. And it is minus pi over p on the other side, okay? And then what you do, I wish I had a pen for this. I don't know if I do. I don't think this pen works. No. Um, this portion from here, from here to here, we're going to take that whole portion and translate it over to here. All right. And so we've taken this portion right here, and we will subtract off of it a 2 pi over p. So th right here, this will end up right over here. So this point here will end up right there. And then uh, later, that point will occur over here. And then finally, the 2 pi over p1, or actually 3 pi over p1, will end up right there. All right? So the, a segment from here to here will translate this way to make this portion of the curve, this portion of the curve. Likewise, this portion over here will translate over this way to make this portion of the curve. All right? So that's band folding. We, we fold these bands back into here, but we don't flip it. We translate this whole thing laterally by minus 2 pi over p, and this part laterally of plus 2 pi over p. So that's step one. The second step is to note that in, um, in band diagrams, various modes, as the bands approach each other, they will uh, repel each other. There will be something called anti-crossings and band gap openings. So whenever you have bands uh, in your band folding technique crossing, you will not actually have that. You'll have uh, this band somewhat uh, uh, sort of repelling against this band as you get closer to this region and repelling. Same with this over here. And so this band will, tend, will then match up with this one. And you'll get a gap between the bands that open up here and, as well as opening up there and there. And so ba bands intersect Brillouin zone boundaries at zero slopes. I'll get back into that. But bands do not cross each other, and they repel each other. So you'll, um, that repulsion and anti-crossing results in, in going from this. Come on, computer. Going from this right here to this right here, all right, due to the anti-crossing and repelling. 
You don't have to worry about why that is. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this course. But it just is. It is indeed the case. Um, and so that you, you have the, um, that anti-crossing. And then also, item number one, bands intersect Rillon zone boundaries at zero slope. And so these things sort of level off right here and intersect these Brillouin zone boundaries at zero slope. So that's sort of in um, Ashcroft and Merman, uh, a higher, a, a more rigorous uh, solid state physics work. But you don't have to worry about that. We won't make use of that. But just note a fairly simple way of, of analytically getting the band diagrams for only moderately curved surfaces. So not too far away from, from a flat surface where you just put in a, a small amount of of uh, amplitude for your curve, you can do this band folding. But if you put in way too much, um, the structure, uh, the dispersion curve can't really be modeled uh, like this because it's so far different than a flat surface that this sort of approximation of constructing the band diagrams no longer holds. But if, if that curve is just very gentle, um, not too high and low, uh, then you can do this band folding technique. But this is where, if it's too high, you go to HSS or numerical console to do the more rigorous model. Or even, there's analytical methods, but we're, uh, I won't do the analytical methods because it's too complex, um, at least for right now. So all of the SP modes in the light cone can be, can, so all these uh, modes right here, and right here, they lie within the light cone. So they can be excited by incident light. And also those modes, once excited, can decay in the propagating light. All right? And so now we have SP modes in the light cone. It's great. Um, so, so, that's, so, so you can get light coupling uh, either by the crutch mark configuration or even better, just by simply patterning your surface, a patterned material now, that has, uh, in which you can tailor these surface plasma modes to do extraordinary things with light. You can trap it, you can guide it, you can, um, you can filter it in particular ways. And one of the things that came up uh, back in 1999, I think it was, um, is uh, surface plasmons yielding or producing Extraordinary optical transmission. So, the same th uh, the same thing and more happens with whole arrays. Namely, incident light can excite surface plasmas. However, these surface so the same thing meaning uh, you can have light incident light coupling. So you can have the same thing that happens uh, uh, compared with uh, just this undulating film. Uh, but now, if your pattern is a whole array, a whole array like this. It's still, it's a pattern with a certain periodicity, P, a lattice constant P, where you have metal, metal, metal. This is air, 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 air. So this is air holes. Uh, it's a pattern material. And now you can have, the incident light can excite surface plasmons that reside on one interface, this top interface. So if light is incident on this side. If, um, if the surface plasmons have the right frequency and momentum, they can be excited by this incident light. If those lie in the light cone, um, and then how these SPs create very strong EM fields at the entrance to the holes right here. These fields can penetrate through the air holes, through the air holes to the other side, onto the other surface. And then those fields will then itself couple into surface plasmon modes on this other side, on this other side. So now you have SPs on this surface being excited. And then those SPs will be within the light cone uh, defined by the underlying material. And those then can uh, couple into radiating light, but going downwards. And so what was found by Evison, T.W. Evison in 1999, uh, was that uh, these holes can be very small. And it is... Um, but yet, in normal, what's called aperture theory, developed by Hans Beth back in the 50s or something, where he said normal light modes, trying to make it through very narrow holes, will produce almost no transmission at all, if the holes are smaller than the wavelength of the incident light, significantly smaller. 
Ibison said, okay, uh, I have this whole array where these holes are indeed much smaller than the wavelength of light. But I'm going to shine light on it anyways and see what I get. So, and he did, uh, the 600 nanometer thick uh, thing of gold, a whole over, uh, a film of gold with holes periodically uh, perforated, uh, put into the film. And he saw that he could see quite readily through the gold film. And so he coined the term extraordinary optical transmission, to say, and, and it was anomalous. It wasn't supposed to be uh, that Han Fest said you weren't going to get this with normal uh, light uh, modes, uh, uh, but yet Evison said, you know, I do. I, I've actually made the film, and you do. So it's not it's not normal regular light modes that are producing the transmission. It is the surface plasmon that are mediating this transmission to the point where you can have extraordinarily large transmissions. Um, and not, uh, not quite a 100% transmission because surface plasmons produce uh, loss of that optical energy within the metal. So you might have uh, a decent amount of optical loss, 50% uh, of the light, 75% of the light, sometimes just maybe 10% of the light is absorbed in the metal due to these high field surface plasmons, but you get a lot more going through than Hans Best's, ap Hans Best's aperture theory would predict. That itself can be used for a wide range of different applications. All right. So in the homework, I'll cover a couple of these applications that we're, we will be looking into. And, uh, and so that's the notes for surface plasmons. Okay? So I'm going to have a couple of homeworks on the Kretschmar configuration, and uh, and then dispersion engineering, and then I'm going to have you do work with Igor on having you do a numerical simulation of whole arrays. All right, take care.